It's not every day you'd be able to see an original World War II Miles Messenger aircraft. Only 83 were built by the British, three of which are now in Australia. It's called a stall aircraft, short takeoff and landing, for the purpose of uh, getting into short field and getting out of short field. And it performs that admirably. It's incredible. 69-year-old Bill Thompson has restored the wooden plane back to its former glory, piece by piece. It's taken five and a half thousand hours, countless tubes of special glue and $35,000. But it's become a priceless possession, complete with historic markings. The stripes there, they were put on on most of the aircraft when they went into Normandy. This was the big day. And you know, Normandy was going to be the end of the war. And they painted the aircraft with these invasion stripes, in black and white. And it was a psychological, oh, masterpiece. And there's been sacrifices along the way. A lot of work, and I lost a finger in the process. <laughs> but what happened? Well, I was foolish with a saw. Uh, a planer on a saw bench, as a matter of fact. But it didn't deter me, I kept it. <laughs> okay. Wife June is accompanying Bill on the flight from Brisbane to Melbourne. With regular stopovers, it's a great opportunity to catch up with family and friends. It's the third aircraft Bill's restored, not a bad effort for a former petty officer in the Navy. The messenger has become a labour of love, carrying with it a lifetime of memories. Well, at my age, I don't have a lot of flying future. I've decided that it's nearly time I gave it away, and I've enjoyed it immensely, so I'm going to quit while I'm ahead. This is my swan song. Russell came up against number one contender Alvin Duke of Kempsey, his toughest opponent so far. He showed more than a glimpse of his outstanding potential by comprehensively outboxing the Southpaw, taking a unanimous points decision after ten rounds. The win gives Russell a professional record of six wins from as many fights and should ensure him a shot at the national title currently held by Victorian Scott Brewer. The $2 million fire brigade complex is the result of 150 years of firefighting in Newcastle and the surrounds. Fires on horse-drawn carriages or the city's trams. Now even word of a fire travels more quickly. The centre takes calls for fires and chemical emergencies from the Hawkesbury to the Queensland border and sends out the closest units in response. But it took the 1989 earthquake to drag the fire centre into this century. And firefighters worked from the shattered shell of the old Cooks Hill station for two years while the new facility took shape. But although the Newcastle earthquake may have demolished many parts of the city, it also built a community spirit that is unbelievable. The minister also promised to do all in his power to continue to make the firefighters' job a better lot. The conditions under which we expect our officers to work is nothing short of a disgrace. I hold my own government responsible. I hold the previous government responsible. Part of a renewed commitment to emergency services will be a new fire station for Mayfield to replace the quake-damaged Ties Hill station. BHP and the Fire Brigade have settled on a site for the new station off the industrial highway. Design work for $500,000 has been set aside for this building project and it will commence shortly and construction is expected to start in the first half of next year. The boat weighs just 200 kilos, but once it hits the water, it takes on the proportions of a speeding bullet. At full tilt, it can reach speeds of 28 knots. Its nearest rival is the 16-footer. They average around 18 knots. <laughs> the 16-footer guys might not like it, but these boats are, are the fastest boats around, basically, and, um, and they're certainly a handful. Moving along at that sort of pace places all sorts of pressure on the gear and any mistake can mean a swim and dipping out of the race. And there's little time for the crew to sit back and enjoy the wind in their hair. 
As you can see by the wing setup on these, it's a sprint from one side to the other while the guys have to maintain their balance and shooting on, pulling on heavy ropes at the same time. Agility, um, the guys have got to be quite agile. It's the first time this crew of Chris Nicholson, Craig Phillips and Gary Boyd have raced together and from the early trials they're already averaging a sixth place and they're turning heads. We're expected first year to be um, 10, 11, 12th sort of position so at the moment um, at the moment we're going above people's expectations anyway. Impressive results meant they didn't have any trouble finding a sponsor. Skilled engineering jumped at the opportunity. Well I'd certainly put them up um, world ranking. I mean uh, Chris has pulled off a couple of world titles and uh, they're local boys and we've got winners. The first race in the series is at Hayman Island in two weeks time. Most babies die of sudden infant death syndrome between the ages of two and four months. The incidence increases during winter. It was paediatrician Dr Susan Beale who was one of the first people to recognise that a baby's sleeping position also played a role in SIDS. Encourage them as soon as possible to enjoy sleeping on the back so that uh, by the dangerous age for sudden infant death they're very comfortable in that position. A baby can't turn onto its stomach from lying on its back until it's about six months old, by which time the most dangerous period has passed. Dr Bill warns that a rocking cradle can allow a child to get into this position. Well, of course, that enables the baby to roll at an age where it wouldn't normally be able to do so developmentally. Dr Beale says since the 1990s SIDS awareness campaign, the number of SIDS deaths has halved. However, she says more research is still needed. Jane Anderson, NBN News. Hundreds of nurses have graduated as midwives over the past 50 years in Hunter hospitals, but the class of 93 closes the book on an era of nursing education which started at the Marta Hospital and expanded to the Royal Newcastle, Belmont and Maitland hospitals. Nowadays midwives are required to study at Newcastle University, having already qualified as nurses. Practical experience will still be carried out at the John Hunter in Belmont. Speaking at today's graduation ceremony, coordinator of the university's graduate diploma course, Maggie Hirsch, spoke of what she calls the subordination of the profession, the prohibitive study expenses and a need for legislative recognition. Midwives are qualified to give supervision, care and advice to women during their pregnancy, labour and delivery and to follow up with the care of newborns and infants. Midwives practice in hospitals, clinics and homes. For the Director of Nursing at the John Hunter's Department of Obstetrics and Gynaecology, Anne Saxton, the final graduation was one of mixed emotions. I can look back with pride on what's occurred in the Hunter Area Health Service Midwifery Program. We have been very innovative over the years in introducing um, new experiences for our student midwives, but hopefully with the advent of the program going to the university that can be expanded even further. But the best accolade of all, baby Ruby Rose Quinnell, daughter of Helen and Dean, delivered by midwives at the John Hunter's Birthing Centre. Andrew Lobb, NBN News. Gums and tongues at the ready, but there are signs that Daniel on the end of the line hasn't quite the stomach for this event. He's already indulged in too much fun of the fair. This trio has already licked all comers during the elimination heats in the Matara Festival's ice cream eating competition earlier in the day. Andrew employs a suction strategy, gaining ground with each gulp on the athletic attempts of Tegan next door. But what drives these children? What pushes them to that next slurp and swallow? Would you believe first prize in this event is a pizza?
How do you feel? A bit sick. Do you think you'll be able to knock over a pizza after this? <laughs> no, nah, probably tomorrow. Or tonight. Matara continues tomorrow. I highlight the grand parade through the city at 11. They say only mad dogs and Englishmen go out in the midday sun, but despite the heat, thousands gathered to see the procession through the heart of the city. Matara's charity princess helped lead the way, followed by about 100 floats, bands and other vehicles. No pictures please, no, no pictures. No. It's wonderful to see so many crowds here. Oh, I just like to come and watch it. I love to come down for the day. I like the parade and it's fun. The parade wound its way down to City Hall. Organisers say the 10-day festival has been an enormous success so far, with an overwhelming response to the live concerts in Civic Park and today's parade. The parade traditionally would have been the finale to the festival. However, tomorrow Matara will finish with the quest to set a world record for holding the biggest barbecue. The Surf Life Saving Association gathered 150 youngsters from Newcastle and the Central Coast areas to show them what the senior ranks has to offer. In recent years, juniors drifted away once they left Nippers. Courses like this teach them basic rescue techniques and CPR and give them the opportunity to try out new equipment in an effort to try and get them to stay on. And at Bar Beach today, the first rounds of the Newcastle Wave Ski Classic saw local boy, 19-year-old Jason Moffat, easily win his heats. The final start tomorrow from midday. To mark the end of the Buskers in the Mall week, a final show was held last night. The three hour Bonanza in the city centre mall featured all the Buskers who had performed over the seven days. Councillor Lynn Dalton presented a plaque to the buskers as a token of appreciation for the world-class entertainment they provided. Jason Neuenhoff, NBN News.
These newfound friends have a lot to talk about. They've come together through the Friendship Force Clubs of Newcastle and Berlin Brandenburg in Germany. A special civic reception at City Hall today officially welcomed the 29 travellers. For most, it's their first visit to Australia, one that's enabled Germans to unite in promoting international relations. Uh, we have eight East Germans in our group, former East Germans, and uh, it's a real uh, adventure for them, and they were so much looking forward to come to Down Under. The visitors have a full week of sightseeing planned. They'll be guests in Newcastle homes, providing a challenge for some. And the ones that don't speak any English are fortunate enough to be staying with people here in Newcastle who speak very good German. There are 300 Friendship Force clubs scattered throughout 30 countries, all sharing a common goal. Understanding of people plus their countries. I mean, they will tell us all sorts of things about their countries, which as a tourist we'd probably never realise. And uh, they will tell us about places. And when we go there, we'll have the opportunity of possibly seeing these places. But if we're on the tourist track, we might not. Melinda Smith, NBN News. The latest lead detectives are investigating is a possible sighting of 17-year-old Alison Newstead at the Cessnock McDonald's restaurant on the night she disappeared. Police want to hear from anyone who may have seen the teenager or her red Chrysler Galant at the restaurant last Wednesday night between 9 and 10 o'clock. Today's search for Alison focused on bushland around Cessnock, however it failed to uncover any new clues about the girl's disappearance. Police have renewed their appeal for public help with calls to be made to Cessnock detectives on 910 199. 910 199. Newcastle's Marching Koalas staged a lively local launch to National Coal Week. Lord Mayor John McNaughton then officially opened Coal Week, a coal arch providing his backdrop. This was purpose built to symbolise the region's involvement with coal since European settlement and to help raise the community's awareness of the importance of the coal industry to our economy. Last year the coal industry earned $7.5 billion, making it our leading export. The Port of Newcastle is a major contributor to this, loading around 42 million tonnes annually. And it really is the foundation of the coal industry in this country. It's where we started and it's now really the biggest exporting port out of, out of New South Wales. Hunter Coal also generates 92% of the state's electricity, but on the world scene, coal no longer enjoys such a monopoly. Before World War I, coal provided around 75% of the world's total energy requirements. Since then, that market share has continuously decreased. Today, it's down to around 28%. But according to the coal industry, that trend may soon change. Because with the developing Asian countries, they really need more energy needs, and Australia is very well placed to supply that market. So if we can be competitive in steaming coal, I think our future is very good. Catherine Lamont, NBN News. A survey by the St Vincent de Paul Society revealed that about one third of people staying at hostels for the homeless on the New South Wales north coast have a history of mental illness. Australia's Human Rights Commissioner Brian Burdekin said many of these people are not receiving appropriate treatment. One of the saddest things about the inquiry is that many of the people on the street um, who are seriously sick, have tried to get into hospitals, have tried to get assistance themselves, or people have tried to get assistance for them, and they just haven't been able to get it. 
There aren't the resources in the community to care for these people. Often when a person's psychiatric condition becomes unmanageable, the police are called in to take them to hospital. While Commissioner Burdekin didn't preempt his findings, he said some people with mental illness are inappropriately being placed in the correctional system. It's a tragedy. Many of our young people affected by mental illness are ending up in jail or remand centres or correctional facilities. Now that's outrageous. We're taking young people who are sick who need care and we're sticking them in jail or remand or detention facilities. Um, that's not only a tragedy for those young people, we will pay an enormously high price as a community for that kind of inappropriate response. In some cases we'll end up locking them up in jail for the rest of their lives. Hostel owner Wilma LaRufa knows of people with psychiatric illnesses who've ended up homeless. So. I've known them to end up in jail. Yes. They end up committing some sort of uh, crime quite often, yes. Sometimes they've actually died on the streets. Without a permanent place to live, there's virtually no chance of people who are mentally ill having their medication properly monitored. This means there's also little chance of effective rehabilitation. Jane Anderson, NBN News. Two-year-old Savannah Harris was back happily playing at a friend's place today, seemingly unaware of the despair her early morning adventure had caused her mother, Stephanie. My alarm went off at 7.30 and I got up then to go and do my pony and um, she just, I looked around and she wasn't in the house and I couldn't hear her so I went outside and had a look. She wasn't out there. That's because shortly before 7 o'clock Savannah decided to go for a stroll, slipping past a side gate at her home in Kurumbung Road, Broadmeadow. She then toddled off up the road about half a kilometre to a nearby overhead bridge. We had a little visitor about uh, 7 15 this morning. She was found wandering up near the Broadmeadow High Level Bridge. A lady who was walking, wandering to the police station. For the next 30 minutes, Savannah died courtesy of the state government. Well, our GSO here looked after the girl, gave her some toast and some uh, chocolate milk, I believe, and uh, she was quite settled in the meal room. Meanwhile, Mum was left to worry. And then I decided to ring the police because she'd done it before, got out before. In fact, Savannah is a bit of a wanderer and a chip off the old block at that. Yeah, um, she takes after me that way. I used to do it as well. I had a um, pony I used to escape from. A few hours after being reunited, Stephanie and Savannah made a quick trip back to the station to thank the local constabulary. Catherine Lamond, NBN News. It's probably the only Olympics held entirely under the one roof. An auditorium at Western Suburbs Leagues Club provided the venue and the competition was fierce amongst competitors from stroke clubs throughout the Hunter and Lake Macquarie. But while it's called the Stroke Olympics, there's also a section for people with other disabilities. Seven events were on the program today, including bowls, putting, dominoes and drafts. Gold and silver was up for grabs, but in the organisers' book, everyone's a winner. The satisfaction of just doing was obvious, and there were none happier than John Carr from Musselbrook. It was a demanding schedule for the 90 competitors and their helpers. More than four hours of competition, with the lunch break the only time for a breather. Catherine Lamond, NBN News.
14-year-old Luke Mewitt knows no fear. Every time he heads onto the track for practice, he pushes his cart to the limit. That drive to go harder than anyone else on the circuit paid off on the weekend when he won the National Junior Clubman Championship. It was a win that everyone in the sport had been waiting for. A remarkable run of bad mechanical luck in the state series robbed him of some easy wins. So no one was more happy than his parents to see him take the chequered flag. In all honesty, it was just pure relief. Um, from a pit crew point of view, you're watching the cart go around uh, every corner, every lap, and you're just waiting for something to fall off. You just, just feel it's not going to make it. So I can imagine how those guys at Bathurst feel now when um, their car comes home. Like all aspiring racing car drivers, Luke knows he must head overseas to have any sort of chance of snaring a drive for a big team. They're really big teams over there. It's almost like the Group A Commodores they bring up with their big trucks and thousand carts per person. It's really organised over there compared to Australia. Luke's dream of an international racing career might not be too far away. Already his Italian sponsor wants him to move to Italy and race the full European circuit. That'd be my lifelong ambition, I think, <laughs> so far anyway. It's a step that mum and dad still have to discuss, so for now he's concentrating on cleaning up the rest of the Australian circuit. Darren Curtis, NBN News. Glenn Carroll throws himself into his sport, literally. As an Australian bobsleigh representative, he can top speeds of 150 kilometres per hour down the one kilometre tracks. After the first run, it's just unbelievable. You get hooked. It's an addiction. While Australia doesn't have the facilities they have overseas, the six-man team makes do between competitions. Glenn spends up to 20 hours a week in the gym preparing for the latest challenge, the Winter Olympics in Lillehammer in Norway. It's starting to really pick up in Australia now and with the amount of people that we're having at our trials and the standard of uh, the people being selected on the team is now uh, coming to the fore. Glenn leaves for Europe on Monday to meet his teammates. He's taking five months off work as a PE teacher in Newcastle. To represent his country will cost him more than $7,000 in airfares and accommodation. Peter Ryan, NBN News. Water quality has been cited as one area the hunter has to improve on following the release of the Environment Protection Authority's first comprehensive report on the state of the environment. Phosphorus levels which contribute to algal blooms have been highlighted as a problem in the Hunter River. 
However, EPA Regional Manager Brian Gilligan says action is already underway. Certainly with things like the elevated phosphorus levels that have been identified in the Hunter, uh, they're being picked up uh, in our pollution reduction programs that we have on industry and that uh, we're working on with the Hunter Water Corporation, for example, with wastewater discharges. Glenbourne and Glennies Creek dams have been described as having water quality problems. However, Upper Hunter MP and Water Resources Minister George Surris says the government is already addressing the problems and believes they're now under control. The EPA is confident there'll be further improvements in the water quality across the region, with the results of the next order due for release in two years. These young athletes are the future of Australian sport. Today that future looked a little brighter with the Greater Building Society in association with the Hunter Academy of Sport announcing a $100,000 fund for young local sports people. Oh super, it's the best news we've had for years. It's, it's really great that young people will be assisted this way. It's all part of the rundown to the 2000 Olympics in Sydney, making sure the best talent makes the games. For young athletes like tennis player Jenny Ann Fetch, the number two rated 16 year old in the state, the chance of a scholarship is a terrific boost. In the first year $10,000 will be divided amongst 10 athletes. They are calling them Australia's fastest and most exciting speedway machines. And tomorrow night, Aussie champion Gary Rush and state champ Brooke Tatnell will be pushing them to the limit. There's no doubt these 370 kilowatt machines have the grunt and it takes a special driver to get them round the tight circuit. Gary Rush has more than 20 years experience on youngster Tatnell and he'll be looking to utilise that experience tomorrow night. Also in the running, brothers Colin and Robert Farr, Sid Moore and Peter Kraft. It's not exactly the bus to work, but all this load of passengers is thinking about is getting on with the job. Today was the first competition session for the state parachuting group championships. A good performance here can mean a trip to the world titles in Greece. Newcastle team Blue Heat rattled through their required routines and completed 15 separate moves in just 45 seconds. It's just pumping, eh? It was just one of those skydives you do that just like, it's just a happening thing, you know? Like, just awesome. By the time the rest of the team touched down, they knew the school was going to be up there with the leaders. Also dropping into the competition today, Sydney skydiver Roz Tompkins. The 27-year-old returned from the World Freestyle Championships last week with a bronze medal and this morning linked up with some old teammates. When you're by yourself, I can cover my own mistakes. I can let something flow or go to the next point. But with this, we've really got to all work together. If the weather stays fine, the championships will continue tomorrow morning at the Eldersley Airfield. 